Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Now, Hallelujah. join us in worship. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise and bless God, you're worthy. God, we love you. God, we bless you. You are great, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord is good, yeah. and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. He's been good, 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 good. All of the days of my life. Yes. Oh, oh, all of the days of my life.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is Minister Tony Phelps, Senior Accountant for Bates Memorial Baptist Church. It is Pastor's Appreciation Month here at Bates Memorial, and we are so happy that you have tuned in as we celebrate the 34th pastoral anniversary of Senior Pastor Dr. F. Bruce Williams and phenomenal woman of God, Dr. Michelle Williams. As we share this time of thanksgiving and praise, let's view another one of our classics from Pastor's Anniversary Weekend 2012. So get ready to get your praise on, for the next voice you will hear is none other than Dr. Jasmine W. Skurlock, founder and senior pastor of Victory Grace Center in Bladensburg, Maryland. Hear ye what the Lord has to say to the church, and I'll see you after the message. Just to lift up your voice wherever you are. Hallelujah. We're going to sing about freedom this morning. I'm free to dance, free to lift my hands to work. Lord, I'm free. Lord, I'm free. I'm free to dance, free to lift my hands to worship. Lord, and I'm free. Lord, and I'm free. I'm free to dance, free to dance and sing, free to lift my hands. Well, I need some free people to Lord, just worship with us. Lord, I'm free. I said I'm free to dance, free to dance and sing. If you are a free worshiper, just get off your couch and pray. Then I'm a free word. I'm a free word. Yes, sir. Things in life that God brought you out of. 
Samuel chapter 17, when you found it, make me feel at home and holler back word. And time will not permit me to read 1 Samuel chapter 17 in its entirety, so allow me to just read a couple of verses and we all will land safely. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 4, which as follow. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistine named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, dropped down to verse number 20. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things, went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistine had drawn up in battle a ray army against army. And David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brother. Drop down particularly at verse number 28. And Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and his anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Drop down to verse number 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. 
And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the army of the living God. Verse number 38, so Saul clothed David with his armor, put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword in his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand and chose him himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag in the porch which he had, and in his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And then drop down to verse number 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So David prevailed over Goliath the giant with a sling and with a stone, struck Goliath and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. On your way to your seat, give your neighbor my sermon title, say, Neighbor, Giants Do Die. That's what I want to preach on. You may be seated in the presence of God. Touch somebody else. Say, giants do die. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. My brothers and sisters in Christ and creation, all of us from the pulpit to the pew will sooner or later have to face a giant in our lives. My brothers and sisters in Christ and creation, whether you are in the pulpit or the pew, all of us, let the church say all of us, will sooner or later have to face a giant in our life. A giant can be anything or anyone that stands between you and your destiny. A giant can be anything or anyone that stands between you and your divine purpose for God. Giant comes in every form, shape, and fashion. And sometimes giant shows up in your public arena, and sometimes they show up in your private life. All I'm certainly trying to tell you is all of us, let the church say all of us, whether we are in the pulpit or the pew, will sooner or later have to face a giant in our lives. Giants come in every shape, every form, and every size. And sometimes giants shows up in your public arena, and sometimes giants shows up in your private life. Sometimes giants are shows up on your job, and sometimes they show up in church. Giants is anybody or anything that stands between you and your divine purpose and stands between you and your destiny. Whether you like it or not, the mere fact that you're saved, sanctified, and Holy Ghost filled does not mean you are exempt from facing giants. Giants are a daily reminder that you and I will have to face barriers and struggles in life. All of us, whether we're in the pulpit or the pew, say, sanctify, Holy Ghost fill, swinging on the chandelier, all of us will eventually have to face a giant in our lives. Giants are anything or anyone that allows Satan to use them to keep you from your divine destiny and your purpose. And sometimes giants shows up either in your private life or they show up in the public arena. A giant can be somebody on your job who's smiling in your face and trying to stab you in your back. A giant can be somebody who's living in your house, eating your food, drinking your Kool-Aid, sleeping in your bed, and can't celebrate what God is doing in your life. A giant can be somebody on the leadership of the church who does not agree with the vision of the church. A giant can be somebody on Facebook or Twitter who ain't got nothing good to say about you. A giant shows up in every form and every 
every shape and every size. And whether you like it or not, all that you save and sanctify, Holy Ghost fill and speaking in unknown tongues, all of us will eventually have to face giants in our lives. But my brothers and sisters, I've already given you the good news. I've already given you reason to shout this morning. I'm not even going to wait till I get to the end of the sermon to tell you why to shout. I already told you why you want to shout and that is in my title of my message that it doesn't matter the size of the giant it doesn't matter the color of the giant it doesn't matter the political affiliation of the giant it doesn't matter if the giant is Republican or Democrat it doesn't matter if the giant is save or unsafe I've already given you the good news and that is giant do die God help me right here I've already given you the reason why you want to shout that it doesn't matter the size of the giant it doesn't matter the color of the giant it doesn't matter the pedigree of the giant I've come to Louisville Kentucky to tell somebody that your giant is about to die and the bigger he is the harder he fall. Who am I preaching to this morning? Touching him and say, your giant is going down this morning. It doesn't matter how long he's been in your life. It doesn't matter how big or bad he is. It doesn't matter how sophisticated and bold he is. The Bible tells us that eventually all giant will eventually have to die. In fact, it's right there in our text. Come up close and let me introduce you to a giant killer. Touching him and say, that's what I am. I I'm a giant killer. Uh, I was born to kill giants. Uh, I was born to be the head and not the tail. Uh, I was born to be above and not beneath. Uh, I was born to be in a position of power and authority. Uh, David is the number one giant killer. Uh, David shows you and I how to handle uh, whatever size giant is in our lives. Uh, come up close and let's look at David's resume. Uh, you do understand that David was anointed at the age of 17 but he doesn't become king until the age of 37 don't miss that he's been anointed at the age of 17 but he doesn't become king until the age of 37 David has the anointment but somebody is occupying his seat the person who is occupying his seat is by the name of Saul Saul has the appointment but David has the anointment David is God's choice but Saul is the people's choice and nothing is worse in life than when you are the people's choice, but you're not God's choice. And if you got a decision to make this morning, touch your neighbor and say, if I got to choose between you and God, I'd rather be favor with God and you can't stand me than be your friend and God be against me. Because last time I checked, only God woke me up this morning. Only God started me on my way. So I'd rather you hate on me and God love me than you love me and God can't stand me. Uh, David, come on, sit down. Somebody back there is trying to see. Uh, here is David. David, David has the anointment. He's anointed at the age of 17, uh, but he's waiting on the appointment. Don't miss this young people. Uh, he's got the anointment at the age of 17, uh, but he doesn't get the appointment until the age of 37. Uh, somebody is occupying his seat. Uh, and the question you've got to raise this morning uh, is why would God anoint David at 17? but doesn't give him the appointment until the age of 37. Why would God delay David's appointment? God delayed David's appointment because God is trying to teach us something. And what God is trying to teach us is that charisma will get you in the door, but character will keep you in the door. I just said something. Uh, charisma will get the door open, uh, but it takes character to get you to stay in the door. Uh, and everybody have charisma, uh, but everybody in got character. Uh, and it take time for you to develop your character. You don't just get character overnight. You got to be through something. Uh, and when you've been through something and you're gone through something, ain't nobody got to preach you up. Ain't nobody got to pump you up. Ain't nobody got to pray you up. Ain't nobody got to ham and be you three up. When you've been through something, you can shout all by yourself. Would you slap five at your neighbor and say, neighbor, my praise is not predicated on you. If you don't holler this morning, I holler all by myself. 
come on, come on. Here it is, here it is. Come on, sit down. That's just my introduction. Here is David, here is David. Here is David who's got the anointment, but he's waited on the appointment. And the reason why God delays David's appointment is because God is trying to teach us that when he opens the door for us, that charisma will get us in the door, but character will keep us there. And that's what kept your pastor for 26 years. It's not just his charisma. It's about character. He's a man of integrity. He say what he means and he means what he say. And he ain't taking it back. God help me. He's a man not just of charisma. He's a man of character. And David has the anointment. But God is working on David to build up his character. Don't miss this. David has the anointment, but Saul has the appointment. And while David is waiting on the appointment, he's serving the person who occupies his seat. Because one of the signs that you know you're anointed is when you can serve the person who's sitting in your seat. One of the signs that you you know that you're saved is you can shout over somebody else's blessing. One of the signs that you know that you love God is you will holler for your neighbor's deliverance. So do me a favor and look down your row and say, neighbor, this shout ain't even for my stuff, it's for yours. This hallelujah ain't even for my stuff, it's for yours. This thank you, Jesus, ain't just for my stuff, it's for yours. This glory, glory ain't just for my stuff, it's for yours. And just in case you don't know why you should holler for your neighbor the reason you want to holler for your neighbor is because if God is blessing your neighbor it means he's on your pew so when he gets through with your neighbor you're next in line slap five at your neighbor and say I'm hollering for your stuff your blessing your breakthrough your anointed your ministry I'm not going to play a hate. I'm going to celebrate. Here is David. Here is David. What? Come on, sit down. Y'all going to mess the DVD up. One of the sign, one of the sign, one of the sign that you know that you're anointed is when you can serve the person who is occupying your seat is when you are not the soloist, but you can holler over the person who's singing the solo. It's when you're not the main preacher, but you can go ahead and say, preach black woman, even though you're not the main preacher. It's when you're the associate pastor and can holler over your pastor. It's when you're not the lead usher, but you can shout over the other ushers. Because if you can praise God for somebody else's blessing, then God know he can trust you with your own. Would you do me a favor right here and ask your neighbor a question. Say, are you a praise giver or are you going to be a player hater this morning? Can you shout over my man while you're waiting on yours? Can you shout over my ministry while you're waiting on yours? Can you shout over my money while you're waiting on yours? Because it is no secret what God can do. If he did it for Jazzy Jazz, he can do it for you. Here's David, here's David. He's been anointed at the age of 17. He's waiting on the appointment and God delays David's destiny because God is trying to develop character. Uh, touch anyone and say, that's why I've been delayed. It's because God's trying to develop some stuff in me. Uh, he's trying to work some stuff out of me uh, so he can put some stuff inside of me. Uh, David is back home at his daddy's ranch, uh, developing his character, uh, tending his daddy's flocks and the Bible said Saul who's the current king of Israel find himself in a battle with the children of the Philistine there is a giant that is loose and his name is Goliath Goliath draws a line in the sand and points his finger at the children of Israel and say I dare you to send me a man Goliath gets in the ring declares himself as the heavy disputed champion of the world points his finger at the people of God and say would you please send me somebody who's willing to rumble in the jungle with me and the Bible says that none of the men of Israel dared to get in the ring with Goliath none of the men stepped to the battle and none of the men stepped to the fight in the meantime David is back home on the ranch tending his daddy's flock and his daddy gives him a simple assignment look at the assignment this morning. Take your brother some lunch. Go down to the battle and take your brother some Big Mac and French fries. 
Go down to the battle and take them some Popeyes. Uh, David packs up his bag. Uh, he takes the assignment. Don't miss this. Uh, he takes this small assignment so serious. Uh, he gets down there with the lunch bag. Uh, did y'all miss that? Uh, he takes this small assignment serious. Uh, and he drops off lunch. And while he's there, he sees Goliath. Uh, while he's there, he hears Goliath. Uh, and David begins to speak truth to power. He said, who is this uncircumcised? Philistine who dared to rise up against my God. Did y'all notice something? The only time David, the only time God was mentioned is when David showed up. Before David ever showed up, nobody even mentioned God. I come help some of y'all this morning. Perhaps the reason why God has left you on that job is because the only time you show up is when God is mentioned. Because before you ever showed up, nobody mentioned God. Nobody said anything but God. But you walked in corporate America and you looked the giant in his face and said who is this uncircumcised Philistine? To dare to rise up against my God. David begins to speak truth to power. And David said, I'll go fight him. Are y'all still here? David said, I'll go handle him. I'll make sure and let him know that he can rise up against the people of God. And the Bible said his oldest brother overheard him. Pulls him to the side, pastor. And said, what you doing down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness with? Put a pen right there. I'll come back and get you. David said, what? What have I now done? I, I just came to bring some lunch down to you and then I see Goliath and hear Goliath and I step to the fight and now you upset with me and the Bible said after David walked away from his brother Saul pulled him to the side and said young man you got zeal but you ain't got no knowledge so let me drop some knowledge on you. You just wet behind the ears. You ain't never been in a battle or never been in a fight. You just one of those choir members Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, you just one of those ushers. You ain't never been in a gang and you ain't from the street. But Goliath, from the time he came out of his mama's womb, he's been one of the greatest fighters. And David looks at Saul and he said, I'm not trying to disrespect authority, but at least let me testify. I was tending my daddy's sheep and I killed a lion and a bear. And all I'm trying to tell you, Saul, I may be young, but that don't mean I'm inexperienced. Would I wish I had some young people up in here who say I may be new in church but that don't mean I'm new in Christ. I may be new up in this place but he woke me up and started me on my way. David said my testimony is that God has equipped me to handle the lion and the bear and the same God who has given me victory over the lion and the bear is the same God who will give me victory over Goliath. Saul said oh it's like that you still want to go fight him at least wear my stuff so Saul put his stuff on David David tried to move but he couldn't move in Saul's stuff do me a favor and touch your neighbor say get your own stuff say get your own sermon get your own song get your own man get your own woman get your own kids some trying to hook up with other people's stuff come on say get your get 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 your own stuff David said, no, I can't go with this stuff. I got to take this stuff off. And y'all know the story. David takes Saul's stuff off. He goes down to the brook. He gets him five. Let the church holler five. He gets him five smooth stone. And I assume the reason why David got five smooth stone is because he made the assumption, if I throw one and miss, I still got four. If I throw two and miss, I still got three. And if I throw three and miss, I still got two. But that ain't the reason why he got five. He Googled God. Goliath and he found out Goliath had four other brothers. He said I ain't just going to kill you. I'm going to kill your brother, 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 brother. I wish I had a hundred people up in here who said when God gives you victory he'll give you total victory. He'll give you victory on a Monday. He'll give you victory on a Tuesday. He'll give you where your victory signs at. He'll give you victory on a Wednesday. He'll give you victory on a Thursday because the God that we serve gives us total 
David got him five smooth stone and he heads towards Goliath and Goliath sees him coming and Goliath stretched his shoulder. He raised his head and Goliath started talking trash. He said, oh, you going to come to me like that uh, with a sword and with a spear and you coming to me with stones and a slingshot? Uh, who do you think I am? He's talking trash. David started hollering back at him uh, and David began to prophesy. He said, this day uh, the Lord will give you in my hand. This day I cut your head off. This day I feed your body to the carcasses and this day I will let the world know that giants do die. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Can somebody prophesy to your neighbor this morning and say today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice this day. Somebody holler this day, this day. Not next week, not next month, not next year, but right now, right now, this moment, this season, this hour, this time. David reaching, David reaching his bag and he has a choice between all the stones in his bag. He's got five stones. One is grace and one is justice. One is mercy and one is peace. And he got a hold of mercy. He winded up like a pitcher. He threw that thing. The Holy Ghost got a hold of it. Knocked out Goliath. He ran to Goliath. Cut his head off. Put his head on his shoulder and started singing like Donald Lawrence. Giants do die. The bigger they are the harder they fall. The question this morning is how in the world does a young 17-year-old boy kill a giant? How in the world does a young boy who is wet behind the ears, who never been in battle, handle Goliath? I'm glad you asked the question because David came by this morning to teach us some powerful biblical principles that if we to apply them to our lives, we too will end up being giant killers. Here's the first thing the text is tailored to teach us that if you and I are going to be giant killers, we've got to refuse to listen to negative people. It's why right there, it's why right in the text, Pastor, I'm not lying to your people. It's why right in the text, remember, David is back home. His daddy, Jesse, gives him an assignment. Go take your brother some lunch. He goes down and takes his brother some lunch. He sees Goliath. He hears Goliath. And David has the audacity to open his mouth and to speak truth to power. He said, I'll go fight him. He said, I'll handle him. Who's this uncircumcised Philistine? who dared to rise up against my God. Word started spreading that David has opened his mouth and his oldest brother pulls him to the side and said, what you doing down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness with? Well, if you've been to Sunday school, there's one thing you know about sheep and that is they never come in few. So if the brother put the word few in there, it's because he's belittling David's responsibility. What you doing down here? You ain't even the lead singer. What you doing up in here? You ain't even the main baller. What you doing up in here? You ain't in charge of nothing. He's belittling David's job. But what fascinates me is who is belittling David's job. It's his brother, which implies that sometimes your number one hater is somebody who got your blood. Sometimes your number one hater is somebody who's living in your sheets, who is sleeping in your sheets, drinking your Kool-Aid, driving your car, and can't even holler for you. Sometimes your number one hater is not somebody in the club, it's somebody in church. Sometimes your number one hater is somebody that you helped when they were down, but all of a sudden they roll their eyes at you and think that you think you're all that. A bag of chips and some dip. And sometimes your number one hater uh, is somebody who's your color and not your kind. Uh, and sometimes it's somebody who's your kind and not your color. Uh, just cause they're your color don't mean they are your kind. Uh, just cause they got your last name don't mean they're your family. Uh, just cause they got your DNA don't mean they got your back. Is there anybody up in here that says sometimes your number one hater is somebody who got your last name? 
But not only that, not only that, Pastor, not only that, not only does David have to deal with negativity with somebody who's a part of his family, but now David has to deal with negativity that comes from leadership. God, help me right here. I said negativity from leadership. It's right there in the text. Y'all missed it. It's right in the text. David goes before Saul. Saul is the leader. Saul is the current king. Saul is the one who is in charge, and David David says to Saul, I'll go fight him. And Saul said to David, you ain't able to graduate from high school. You ain't able to go on to college. You ain't able to own your own business. You ain't able to raise a family. You ain't able to run for president. You ain't able to handle Congress. Look what Saul said. Now this is what bothered me. This is what bothered me. Saul is the present king, which implies, please don't miss this, which implies that Goliath is Saul giant I told y'all don't miss it and y'all missed it I'll come get you I said Saul is the present king of Israel which implies that Goliath is not David's giant it is Saul's giant so if anybody should have encouraged David to do what David should have done it should have been Saul because David is about to do what Saul should have done okay I lost some of y'all come let me get you can I suggest this morning that some of you the giant that you're fighting ain't, ain't even yours it's your mama's can I suggest this morning that the giant you're fighting ain't, ain't even yours it's your daddy can I suggest this morning that the giant that the president is fighting ain't, ain't even his it's the last president can I suggest this morning that the giant you're fighting it doesn't even belong to you it belongs to somebody else And the reason why, the reason why you got to fight it is when your mama should have killed it, she slept with it. God help me. When your daddy should have killed it, he fed it. And that's why God is raising a boy up to handle what your daddy didn't do. Is there anybody up in here who said this is the last time I'm going to see this giant in my family? My mama didn't handle it. My daddy didn't handle it. But I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Who am I preaching to? Slap five at your neighbor, say, I got it, I got it. I say, my mama didn't have it, but I got it. My daddy didn't have it, but I got it. My grandmama didn't kill it, but I got it. Because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Push on your neighbor, say, go handle it, go handle it. Go do what your mama didn't do. Go do what your daddy didn't do. Go do what your grandparents didn't do. looking for the young people who said I'm going to handle it. I'm not going to let it destroy me like it destroyed my daddy. I'm going to handle the drugs. I'm going to handle suicide. I'm going to handle poverty. I'm killing this giant today because it's been in my family for too long. Who am I preaching to this morning? David, 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 David said, if you're going to handle your giant, you've got to refuse to listen to negativity, even if that negativity is in leadership or your family. My God, the only way David can handle Goliath is that David had to refuse to listen to negativity. But here's the second thing, lest I keep you too long. David said, the only way I kill Goliath is because I recall past victories. Are y'all still here? He said, I recall past victory. It's why right in the text, I'm not lying to y'all. It's why right that David is standing before Saul. He's telling Saul, listen, I'm going to do for you what you should do for yourself. I'm going to handle your giant. And the Bible said that Saul looks at him and said, you're not able to. And David looks at Saul and said, I'm not trying to disrespect you, Dr. King, but at least let me just go ahead and give my testimony. Give an honor to God, to Pastor Williams, the dedicated deacons, and the trustworthy trustees. 
I just want to testify this morning. Uh, please pray my strength in the Lord. I'm a little bit nervous, uh, but my testimony is uh, I was tending my father's flock, uh, singing Ba Ba Black Sheep, uh, Have You Any Wolf? Uh, and out of nowhere, there came a beer that got a hold of one of my sheep. Uh, I heard my sheep falling and say, Help, I can't get up. Uh, I got a hold of my daddy's spear and I went and killed the bear. And then later on, I tended my daddy's flock, uh, singing Ba Ba. Black sheep, have you any wolf? Out of nowhere came a lion and got a hold of one of my sheep. I heard my sheep say, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. I got a hold of my daddy's spear and I killed the lion. So before I take my seat, I just want to let you know, King, that the same God who gave me victory over the bear and given me victory over is the same God who can give me victory over Goliath. What are you trying to say, Jazzy Jazz? I'm trying to tell you that if you ever want to know what God did going to do in the future, all you got to do is look and see what he did in the past. If he delivered you last year, he can deliver you this year. If he brought you out last year, he can bring you out this year. If he paid your bills last year, he can bring pay your bills this year. If you ever want to know what God is about to do, all you got to do is look back and see what he did in the past. And sometimes, pastor, when you're waiting on God to do something in the future, sometimes all you can do is shout over what he did in the past. So touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what he's going to do in tomorrow, but I'm going to shout over what he did yesterday. I'm going to shout that he kept me. I'm going to shout that he protected me. I'm going to shout that he healed me. I'm going to shout that he delivered me. Pull your neighbor by the hand like you're about to pull it off and say neighbor this shout is cause I survived my past. I outlived my past. I came through my past and if you ain't got no past then sit there and look cute but if the Lord brought you out if the Lord deliver you if the Lord brought you through you ought to throw your head back and open your mouth and act like you ain't got no sense up in here and say when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that is done for me my soul cries out hallelujah I thank God for saving me pull your neighbor by the hand like you're about to pull it off and say neighbor this shout is in spite of the stuff I've been through I don't even look like what I've been through should have been dead buried in my grave lost my mind but I'm still here and while I'm here I'm gonna give him some praise like I lost my mind come on pull your neighbor by the head and say neighbor this shout is for my past for every lie in my past for the folks who gossip in my past for folks who try to destroy me in my past when you see my haters let them know I'm still here I'm still standing I'm still singing I'm still shouting because God's been good. Has it been good to anybody? If, 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 if you're gonna handle if you gonna handle your giant, you got to refuse to listen to negative people and you got to we call pass victory and listen the prerequisite to killing Goliath is that you've killed your lion and your bear I just said something the prerequisite for handling Goliath is you kill your lion and your bear what that got to do with you well you can't thank God and wait for Mercedes until you can shout in a hoop team if you can't holler in pay less you ain't gonna holler in Nine West. If you can't shout in Casual Corner, you ain't gonna shout in St. John. So pull your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm waiting to be upgraded, but while I'm waiting on it, I praise him for my past. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. We got to get out of here. Uh, if you're going to handle your giant, if you're going to be a giant killer, you've got to refuse to listen to negative people. If you're going to be a giant killer, you've got to hit rewind before you hit fast forward. Okay, but here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. If you're going to be a giant killer, you've got to resist the temptation to use untested weapons. 
It rises. Come on, sit down. It's why then the text. If you're going to be a giant killer, you have to resist the temptation to use untested weapons. It's right in the text. I'm not lying to your people. It's right there. Saul said, okay, you want to go fight him? I told you you can't fight him, but you want to go fight him? Okay, go fight him. But at least wear my stuff. Hey, man, come on up here. Come on. I need your jacket. Uh, uh, if you're going to go fight him, at least wear my stuff. God help me. Can I get a... If you're going to go fight him, at least wear my stuff. And the Bible said that David put on Saul's stuff, but he couldn't move with Saul's stuff because Saul's stuff wasn't made for him. I, I came to help somebody this morning. That's a problem with some of you, is you've been trying to wear other people's stuff. Touch your neighbor, say, neighbor, in 2012, be who you is. Come on, say, don't try to be the next T.D. Jakes. Don't try to be the next Juanita Bynum. Don't try to be the next Kurt Franklin. Just be who you is. Because the same God who called them is the same God who called you and anointed you. And the best you you can be is be you. Pull your neighbor by the head and say, I just got to be me. I'm trying to be all cute and sophisticated. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I got to wave my hands. I got to shake my leg. I got to holler up in here. And nothing is worse than wearing another man's stuff. Nothing is worse than marrying another man's wife. Nothing is worse than living in another man's house. Nothing is worse than pastoring another a man's church but when God got something for you you ain't got to take nothing from nobody else because when God has something for you it always with you in mind let me get out of here when I first started preaching I was told by some friends that if you're going to be a good preacher or a great preacher you need a suit from Michael Sahi they told me if you're going to be a great preacher you need at least one suit from Michael Sahi. So I called Michael Sahi and I said, they told me if I'm going to be a great preacher, I need a suit from you. Michael Sahi measured me. He said, give me six weeks and I'll send you a suit in the mail. Sure enough, y'all, six weeks after, my suit showed up in the mail. Before I opened the suit, there's an envelope on the box. And so I opened the envelope. It's called an invoice. Y'all, I nearly fainted. I was about to have a nervous breakdown. I, I've never seen a, a suit that cost so much. It had a comma after a number. It had two other points after that. And then it had a decimal point. I called Michael on the phone. I said, man, did y'all make a typo error? Because I've never seen a, a suit that cost so much. He says to me, Jazzy Jazz, have you opened the package? I said, no, man, I'm too scared to open the package. I'm still looking at the invoice. He said, do me a favor and open the box and then call me back. Pastor Williams, I opened the box. I have to admit, the suit looked good, but my eyes were still on the invoice. I called Michael Sahi and I said, man, the suit looked good, but are you sure you didn't make a typo with this invoice? He said, Pastor Jazz, have you tried on the suit? I said, no, man. He said, do me a favor and try the suit on so showing up I try the suit on I call Michael Sahi I said man I got bad news for you I said I've seen this suit at JC Penny I said man I've seen this suit at Macy's I said I've seen this suit at Casual Corner he said no Pastor Jazz you didn't see that suit I said I'm telling you Michael I saw that suit and it didn't cost this much and that's when Michael said to me he said, do me a favor. Do you still have the suit on? I said, yeah, I still got it on. He said, look inside the suit because there's something in the suit that's not in the suit at Macy's. That's not in the suit at uh, JCPenney. And sure enough, I looked in the suit and my name was in the suit because it was made for me. Good night, children. And God bless you real good. And pull your neighbor by the head and say, neighbor, I don't want nothing that ain't got my name on it but if it got my name on it it belongs to me pull your neighbor
neighbor by the head and say, neighbor, I don't want no car that ain't got my name on it. I don't want no blessing that ain't got my name on it. I don't want no house that ain't got my name on it. But if it got my name on it, it's mine. Is there anybody who is here this morning that can testify that there's some blessings that got your name on it? There's some breakthrough that got your name on it. There's some deliverance that got your name on it. Pull your neighbor by the head and say, put your name on it. It's yours this morning because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Good night, children, and God bless you real good. And thank you for having me. And I hope I didn't bore you. But is there anybody in here who can testify this morning that God has given you victory and your name is on it? I've seen the lightning flash and I've heard the thunder roll. I've seen sin breaking, dashing about to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus. He said, fight on. He promised never to leave me and never to leave me alone. He walks with me and he talks with me, picks me up, turn me around, plant my feet, plant my feet. If you're going you to handle your giant, you got to refuse to listen to negative people. Pastor, they got a recall past victory. You got to resist the temptation to try to be anything that God didn't create you to be. Then after you've done all that, I hope you won't forget that the battle is not yours. <laughs> it's the Lord. You do understand David wasn't fighting for victory. He already had victory. Well, listen, David had a stone and he threw the stone. This morning, you got a rock. David had a stone and he threw his stone. But in 2012, you ain't got a stone. You got a and here's the difference between a stone and a rock. You throw a stone, but you stand on a rock. I'll see you all later. Touch your neighbor and say, after you've done all you can, you just, you just stand because the battle is not yours. We hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message, and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If you want to be saved and have new life in Jesus Christ, pray this prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now, and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus, but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen, and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you.
I know you couldn't help but to give God praise for that powerful message from our speaker of the hour. We thank God again for Dr. Skurlock and for the message which is as relevant today as it was back in 2012. Now, this is the time for the giving of our tithes and offering and giving us a reflection of our gratefulness to God for his grace and mercy toward us and an opportunity for us to be a blessing not only to the body of Christ, but to the community and the entire world. So let's listen as our pastor speaks to us about giving. We're able to provide this word for you through this medium as a consequence of very faithful disciples who are members of Base Memorial Baptist Church and a growing number of people who consider themselves friends of Base Memorial. They give and we try our best to make it as convenient as possible to give. And maybe you want to join either the church or you want to join that group of faithful givers. And there's several ways you can give. You can give by cash app, dollar sign Base Memorial. You can go online, basememorial.com and click on to the giving tab and give. You can give uh, by text information should be on the screen, or you can just drop by and drop off your tithes, offering and sacrificial giving, a special gift, and we'll make sure it gets where it's supposed to get. If none of those things work, don't worry. We take snail mail too, so you can just mail it in at Base Memorial 620, that's 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203, and we promise you it will get where it's supposed to get. Got it. What a time in the Lord we have been able to share today, but before we depart, we don't want to leave without you receiving the prayer and the benediction. Let us pray together. Oh, gracious God, we thank you once again for another day that we have been allowed to see, for another Sabbath day that we have been able to share in together, and for the word that has been given to us. Oh, God, we just pray that the word that we have received that it will be sown in our hearts and we will take that word and share it with the entire world. Now, God, we ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to receive the benediction, which comes from Numbers 6, 24 through 26, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.